I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whatever, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Good morning, Covenant. Well, we live in a world that places a high value on power and strength, don't we? All you have to do is look at, for instance, professional sports, right? Who here has been watching the Women's World Cup? Oh, like three of us, right? <laughs> Soccer, okay, Desmond, right, yeah. Soccer's not, my, yep, Jackson, there's a few of us. Well, if you've tuned in, you'll see our national team, our women's national team, but what prime examples of strength, power, agility, right? But if you're not a soccer fan, I get it, I get it. What about the NFL? What about the NBA, right? Prime examples of strength and power. Um, even golfers, right? Golfers today look quite buff, whereas long ago, you know, they didn't have to look that way. Power and strength. Not only in the sports arena do we see power and strength, but also in the corporate world, right? And here, power and strength is not demonstrated in your physical abilities, but it's in your intellectual capabilities, your relational capabilities, your skills, your capabilities, your savvy, your ability to manipulate and work the system. But let me tell you this, no matter how strong we may look on the outside, all of us are gonna experience some form of weakness or another. All of us, there's no one on this planet that is exempt from this. All of us are gonna experience weakness and I wanted to give you guys some personal examples this morning, just to give you just an idea of all the different categories of weakness there are. Some of you may have caught on to the fact that I don't look like most of you guys. Right? It's okay to laugh. It's okay to laugh. Um, so I grew up, and uh, I think I was the only Asian in my school. And uh, it was a lonely place to be. In fact, it, it felt like at times I was the only Asian in the county. Um, and as a result, I wasn't really treated well at times. Uh, at times I was bullied, got into lots of fights, was picked on. Uh, it left me feeling weak and powerless. Uh, and it didn't help the fact that growing up, I was a little guy, I was small. Um, let me give you another example. Uh, and this is one where I experienced weakness through other people. Uh, some of you know that uh, my nephew, Mac, uh, last year he was 18. He was on the verge of graduating from high school. And, and Mac in our family, he is, he is the epitome of power and strength. Uh, he's a prime athlete. He's getting ready to go to the University of Georgia and he suffered a major brain bleed. Today he fights every day to gain back what you and I take for granted. And as I watch my sister and her family, day after day with their battle, I feel the weakness. I feel the powerlessness. A couple more examples. I worked in the corporate world for 25 years. 
And I spent 15 of those years with one company. And you know what happened? I got laid off. How did that make me feel? It made me feel quite, quite weak. A couple years ago, we faced legal action against our family business. And I know some of you guys know what this feels like. I had my very first panic attack a couple years ago. And that, you know, I was literally laying on the floor and I felt so small. So, so small. I work here at Covenant in pastoral care, which means I have a great privilege of walking beside so many people in their brokenness. And I've seen a lifetime of brokenness, whether it's disease, life-threatening disease, divorce, death, loss of loved ones, abuse, addiction. And I feel the weakness. And it really greatly impacts me. Uh, there hasn't been a time, whether it's in this job or in the corporate world, uh, struggling with the feeling of being not adequate, not enough. At times, I don't feel significant. Some of you guys can relate to this one. Uh, this past month, I turned 51. And yeah, that's not, you don't need to cheer about that. Um, and uh, not a year goes by that I don't feel a new ache, a new pain, a new realization that I can't any longer do what I used to do, and it makes me feel weak. So I'm constantly reminded, constantly reminded many different ways that I'm weak, that I'm powerless, that I'm small. So what does this have to do with our passage today, right? The Apostle Paul, he's going to say something stunning. He's going to say something outrageous. He's going to say that he gladly boasts in his weaknesses. He says that. And he says also he's content. He's content with sufferings. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of the, the areas of weakness that I just talked about, I don't gladly boast in that. It's very painful for me. I'm not even content with that, so I think I have something to learn from the Apostle Paul this morning. Here is the takeaway truth. I want you guys to grab a hold of this. All too often, we look to the wrong things for strength. But God's strength and His power in our lives is activated when we embrace our weaknesses, when we embrace our weaknesses. And that's what we're going to see from the Apostle Paul here. So I want to set the context of the passage of chapter 12. What's going on here in this passage of Scripture is the Apostle Paul is arguing He's been arguing for a couple chapters. Why is he arguing? He's defending his ministry. He's defending his fact that he is an apostle against false apostles who have crept into the Corinthian church. And he has to lay out his resume, so to speak. He has to lay out his credentials, his experience, and he does so kind of grudgingly. He does so reticently because he knows this is nothing to boast about, my great experiences. And that's where we find ourselves in the beginning of chapter 12, where you, Andrea just read this strange account, right? The third heaven, a man caught up to the third heaven, hearing things that he can't repeat. And so don't get hung up on that, because I know some of you guys are all about what is the third heaven and, and things like that. But see it in the larger context. That this is just another one of the bullets on his resume that he's pointing to. I have a special experience. I've have special revelation that the other so-called apostles cannot claim. Right? I have that. You do not have that. But then it falls on in our passage that he says that the Lord gave me a thorn in the flesh. He gave me a thorn in the flesh. Why? So I don't get conceited. Now, throughout church history, there's been many speculations about what is this thorn in the flesh? What is this? Some have thought that maybe it's a physical ailment, right? He was sick. He had some kind of disease. Some think it was some kind of impediment that he had. Maybe he had a speech impediment. Elsewhere in the scriptures, we see that Paul says that he, he wasn't a great speaker. Maybe he had some kind of physical disfigurement, a psychological issue. Maybe he struggled with depression or anxiety. We really don't know what it was, but we do know this. It bothered him greatly. It harassed him. It tormented him, and he wanted to get rid of it. And so he pleads with the Lord three times. So just as a sketch of where I'm going with the sermon, 
Um, I'm going to give you three categories of weakness. Three categories of weakness. I'm going to give you three ways that you can embrace weakness. And then I'm going to follow it with two results. And those of you guys who are good at math said three, three, two. Man, that's eight points. What is this? <laughs> so uh, you guys got to buckle up. I'm going to do my best to move quickly through some of these points. But here we go. The three categories of weakness. Our broken world. Others sin against us in our own sin. Okay? Those are the three categories of weakness I want to talk about. So our broken world, you guys know about this. We know about this from Genesis 3 in the fall. And we know about it from Romans 8. Every aspect of God's creation, every aspect, has been marred by sin in the fall. And in Romans 8, 20 through 22, it says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, and hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. The creation has been groaning. Now, if you guys remember last week, Jerry talked about that groaning. Part of that groaning is the anticipation of giving birth. The day when all things will be made new. But part of that groaning, as Paul is saying, is the pains of childbirth. We're still in the pains of childbirth. All has not been made new. We live in the now and not yet. And so there is brokenness. Brokenness. And it makes us feel weak. It makes us feel powerless. And I'm talking about things like diseases, cancer, disabilities, broken relationships, broken society, broken societal structures, racial division, death and loss of loved ones, psychological issues, mental diseases, some forms of poverty, the toil and stress of work, nature itself is broken by sin. If you've lost a loved one, you know in your heart, this is not the way the world was meant to be. It's not. And you feel that brokenness. Second category, others sin against us. When we are sinned against, it leaves a mark on us. It leaves an indelible impression on our being. Right? Because we're created in the image of God. You know what that means? It means that we are special. We're different from the animals. We're different from the rest of creation. We're made in His image. We matter. We're significant. We're worth something. And when someone sins against you, they're taking that away. They're saying you're something less. So whether it's abuse, whether they're deceiving you, whether they're lying against you or taking something from you, they're saying you're not worth it. And that hurts. It makes us feel weak. It makes us feel powerless. And unfortunately, sometimes we believe that lie. We begin to believe those lies that we really aren't worth anything, that we don't matter. And so that's the second category of weakness. And the last one is our own sin. And yes, our own sin, it enslaves us, it entraps us, and it makes us weak. And I know most of you would look at people with addictions and you'd say, aha, yep, that person, they're weak, they're powerless. They can't give up their habit. They can't give up that substance. They're weak. But let me tell you this, that we're all addicted to sin. We're all addicted. We all have idolatries in our heart. We all have things that we cherish more than the Lord. We haven't loved Him with our whole heart. John Owen said this in his book, Overcoming Sin and Temptation. Every unmortified sin will do two things. It will weaken the soul and deprive it of its vigor. It will darken the soul and deprive it of its comfort and peace. Sin weakens us. Sin weakens us. I want you guys to hear that. Whether you realize it or not, when you're engaging in sin, it weakens you. It's depriving you of something. So I want to make sure that you guys understand this. Caveats. Okay? This, this whole topic of weakness is quite nuanced. It's quite complex. And I want to make sure you guys don't walk away with the wrong impression. 
What I'm not saying this morning is that you should embrace your sin. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you can go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm just weak in this area. It's not an excuse to continue in your sin. And if you're in, if you're in that place, you need to stop. You need to turn from it. It's also not an excuse to condone sin in others, especially against you. That's wrong. We don't condone that. And I'm not saying that we're going to be content with the brokenness of this world. In fact, if you guys know our mission now, we've, we've been talking about it a lot, right? Bringing gospel restoration to people's deepest needs in our broken world. Our church, we want to engage in the brokenness of this world, so we're not content with seeing that. Make sure you guys understand, I'm not saying that we continue in sin, that we're not happy about it. Let me give you three ways of how we can embrace our weakness. So we have a lot of ways that we do wrong, right? We like to compensate for our weakness. If you're like me, you like to run away from weakness, like to hide from it. None of us likes to appear weak. We withdraw, we reject it, we deny, we get angry. We have a lot of different mechanisms to cope with weakness. But I want us to look at what Paul says and look at the scriptures and find three ways And the first is trusting that God is sovereign and has ordained our weakness for our good. He's sovereign and has ordained our weakness for our good. And we see that in verse 7. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Now, in in the grammar here, Paul is using the passive case. And what it means is he's saying that this thorn is coming directly from God. And we know from Scripture that God is sovereign. He's control over all things. Yet he's not the author of sin. And some of you might pause at that and say, does that mean he's sovereign over my cancer? Is he sovereign over my nephew's brain bleed? The death of my loved one? And as gently as I can say this, that I want to affirm that Scripture says, God is sovereign over everything. What kind of God would He be if He's only sovereign over the good things and not the bad? He's Lord of all creation. He's sovereign over everything. He's in control. And so whatever's happening, He is not out of control. He's not asleep. He wasn't asleep or not paying attention when that bad thing happened. God is sovereign and has ordained it for our good. He allows the weakness in our life. In Romans 8.28, it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. God has a purpose in your suffering. Now, we don't always know what that purpose is, but we can trust that He's working for our good. We can trust that We can trust because we also know the character of our loving Father, right? I love that song, Good, Good Father. There's a verse in that song that strikes me every time we sing it. We sing it, you are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Now that's a hard thing to sing if you've got a thorn in the flesh. To say that what's going on is God's perfection. His way is perfect. What's going on is perfect. He has a purpose in that. I want you to see a second purpose. And that comes in the following chapter. In chapter 13, Paul's going to say this in 2 Corinthians 13, 9. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. We're glad when we're weak and you are strong. What what is he talking about there? He's saying he's glad when the church is strong, when the people are being restored. So we see another purpose, perhaps, in our weakness. It's not about me. It's not about me. Sometimes it's not about us. It's about everybody else. And God using our weakness for the good of the body, to build up the body. 
I wanted to give you a couple of illustrations of this. You guys know our worship director, Paxton Jean Cake, he's shared his story of recovery from addiction. And he doesn't embrace his sin, but he's embraced that weakness. He's embraced his story, and he is being used by God to bring healing, to build up other people who are struggling the same way. Right? Second example, Andrea Diener. Most of you know her story of past sexual abuse and how God is using her now today to bring healing and hope to many others. God using weak, horrible situations to bring life, to bring healing to his body. If you don't like those examples, look at the life of Joseph, and you'll see the same thing. What was a horrible situation, God says it was for good. He's preserving the people of Israel. And secondly, we can embrace weakness by depending on God through prayer. And we see this in verse 8. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. See, Paul recognizes that the thorn is from God and that he's dependent on God. And who does he go to? He goes to God and he pleads. He pleads three times and he actually gets an answer. I would suggest for most of us, we're going to plead more than three times. We're going to plead over and over again. And I urge you, brothers and sisters, to do that. Plead until you get the answer from your loving Father. Go to him. Perhaps he will grant you your request. Perhaps he will heal you. Perhaps he will take your thorn away. Pray to him because he's in control. In Paul's case, he didn't grant his request. God gave him an answer, but he didn't heal him. And do you hear that? Here we have the Apostle Paul praying for healing, praying for something, and he didn't get it. What does that say about the churches who say that all you have to do is pray, you have to have enough faith, and it's going to happen for you? You can be healthy, you can be wealthy. That's not what we see here in the Scriptures. It's not what we see here. Maybe Paul didn't have enough faith, but I hope you see the tongue in my cheek there when I say that. Tim Keller says it this way, Lord, prayerlessness is a sin against you. It comes from a self-sufficiency that is wrong and that dishonors you. Prayerlessness is also a sin against those around me. I should be engaging my heart and your power in their needs. When we don't pray, we're saying we have the resources. We can do this on our own. We don't need God. This life was never meant to be lived on our own. We were, cr were created beings, first of all, right? We're not God. We're created beings. We're dependent on the one who created us. More than that, we're created to be in relationship with him, our good father. So we should go to him. Brothers and sisters, if you've got a thorn in the flesh, plead with God. Plead with him. May he grant your request. And thirdly, we can embrace weakness by trusting that God's grace is all that you need. We see this in verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, some of you have heard that and are saying that's a non-answer. Sounds like a little bit like a non-answer, doesn't it? Especially if you're struggling with that thorn in the flesh. You're, you're thinking you want something tangible. You want some relief. You want change. You want healing. You want out of your situation. And all I get is, my grace is sufficient for you. Hmm. So I think we need to understand God's grace a little bit better. And what a vast topic God's grace is. It's like a jewel, a multifaceted jewel. And I'm just going to talk to you about one little facet. One little facet. Two illustrations of that. Moses, in Exodus chapter 3, the burning bush, most of you guys know this story. Moses, he looks out on the mountain and he sees the burning bush. And he's watching it for a while and he says, hmm, it's not getting consumed. You and I would go and check that out. And that's exactly what he did. And so in Exodus chapter 3, we find this. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, 
Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, God said, but I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that, you, that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. God's calling to him out of the bush. What does Moses say? He basically says, I'm weak. I'm not the guy. I can't do this. And God says what? I will be with you. Okay? I will be with you. So put a pin in that. I'm going to talk about the second example. Fast forward in time to Joshua. Joshua is on the brink of the promised land. Moses is dead. Joshua is now taking command. Joshua has a big task. He's got to go into the, the promised land. He's got to assemble this army. He's got to conquer. And he's following in some pretty big footsteps. Moses is the guy th through which God did mighty, mighty miracles. Don't you think Joshua felt weak at times? Don't you think Joshua is wondering, hmm, I don't think I'm the guy for this. What does God say to him? He says in Joshua 1, 9, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Did you hear that? The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's the same thing he said to Moses. In fact, in Joshua 1.5, he says, As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you, nor will I forsake you. God is saying, I will be with you. And it's much more than him saying, I'm just going to be there. I'm going to be present. That's not what he's talking about. This is God's favored presence. His favored presence. What does that mean? He's, it means he's on your team. He's on your side. He's for you. He's not against you. This is his grace. Unmerited favor towards weak men like Joshua and Moses. And you know, Joshua and Moses, when they got that word from the Lord, they didn't know how it was all going to play out. They didn't know how God's grace would play out. They got the same word. I'm going to be with you. Joshua's probably thinking, you know, Lord, how is this going to work? Am I going to get some super cool weapon? You know, these bows and arrows and swords, I mean, I could do a lot better if I had an advanced weapon to, to, to wipe out the people on the land there. He didn't know. That's the point. They didn't know. And you know what? With your thorn, your weakness, you also don't know how God's going to work out His grace in your life. That's why I say trust that His grace is all you need. His grace is enough for you. And the result, I'm going to give you two results now. If you dare to trust, to embrace weakness, the first result, God's power will work through your weakness. Verse 9 says, But He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is God's economy. What do I mean by that? This is how God works in the world. I gave you two examples. If you go through the Scriptures, you're going to see over and over and over again examples of God using weak people to accomplish His mighty deeds. Fast forward to the New Testament and look at the life of the disciples, right? Weak and foolish men God used those to build the church, to change the face of the planet Earth. That's how God works. And I think that we need to reprogram the way we think about weakness. We need to reprogram our mind because when we think of weakness, we're like, I don't want that. That's bad. Got to get away from it. Got to minimize it. Do whatever we can. But no, this is the opportunity for God's power to show up. We know this by experience. Where on planet Earth is the church of God flourishing? It's flourishing places like Asia, Africa, and some places in the Middle East. And what's going on in all those places, right? Churches are getting burned down. Churches are getting closed. Pastors are getting thrown in jail. Congregations are getting disbanded. Christians are getting executed. And we would stand on the outside and say, 
that looks weak. The church is just going to shut down and close there. But the church of God is flourishing in that weakness because God is showing up in a mighty way saying, no, no, I'm powerful. I'm the almighty God. I work through weakness. And sadly, as we look at America, what's happening to the church here in the West? We have all of the resources. We have all of the money. We have all the talented preachers. We have all the great seminaries and theologians. But the church is shrinking. Now, I don't have all the answers to what God's up to and why this is happening. But perhaps we're relying a little bit too much on all those things we have, our freedoms, our resources. We're relying on the wrong things, maybe. We're not depending on the Lord. Why does God do it this way? He does it so that He gets the glory, not us. The second result, we will find contentment. And we see this in verse 10. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, and hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We can be content. If we embrace our weakness, we can be content where God has us. That's a hard thing. That word content, eudoko in the Greek, means to delight or take pleasure in. Delight or take pleasure in. Some of your translations are going to say that. And that seems a lot stronger, right? I can't say that I delight or take pleasure in weakness. It sounds crazy. It sounds foolish. And if you're here today struggling with a thorn in the flesh, some kind of weakness, let me ask you, where is your heart? Can you say with the Apostle Paul that you gladly boast in your weakness? It's tough. It's tough. I don't think more effort is going to get us there. I don't think putting more effort into those three points that I gave you is going to get us there. It's simply, simply too hard because it's more than just knowing that God's in control that He has our good in mind, right? It's more than just knowing that His grace is enough. It needs to go from here to here. Our hearts have got to change. Our hearts have to be captivated. We won't embrace weakness until we are captivated and empowered by the One who voluntarily and willingly embraced weakness for us. We won't embrace weakness until we are captivated and empowered by the one who voluntarily and willingly embraced weakness for us. See, you and I, we can't hardly embrace weakness for ourselves, much less consider that there's a person out there who would embrace weakness on our behalf. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He embraced weakness for us. He put on flesh the almighty, infinite, all-powerful God, the God of glory, does what? He puts on flesh. He sets aside His glory. He sets aside His rights and privileges. And He comes and He lives as a man for you and for me. The God who is worthy of all of our worship and praise, the God who we should all serve, He came to serve us, to become weak. And what a picture we have in John 13 of this, where Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples. Now, you've got to get this picture in your head. Here we have the God of the universe, the glorious God of the universe, on his hands and knees doing a lowly servant's task of washing grimy feet. And because he's God, he does everything with excellence, right? I don't think he just kind of, okay, we're done. Wash my hands. No. I think he did a great job of washing their feet. He even washed the feet of Judas, the one who would betray him. And the world would look on this and say, that, what weakness? 
But that's the power of God. And ultimately, the ultimate display of his power and weakness at the same time is him going to the cross on our behalf. Voluntarily going to the cross and embracing weakness for us. So I encourage you, brothers and sisters, this morning, fix your eyes on this Jesus. He didn't have a figurative thorn in the flesh like Paul. He had real thorns in the flesh. He had nails in his flesh. He, like Paul, pleaded three times, God, if there's any other way other than the cross and torture, I want it. And you know what? God did not take away the thorns and the nails. Instead, he received God's grace, his favor to bear up, to bear the cross for you and me. And so whether you're a believer or an unbeliever this morning, we all need the same thing. We need a heart change. We need to be captivated. We need to be enthralled by the beauty of the one who did this for us. And if we embrace Jesus by faith, the one who embraced weakness for us, he's going to empower us to do the same. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, Lord, it is, it is tough to trust you, that you are good, that you mean for our good, that you're in control of all things, that your grace is enough for us. So, Lord, I pray that you would raise our eyes up off of our circumstances, off of our thorns and weakness, and put them on your Son. And may we behold his beauty, the beauty, the love of the one who willingly embraced weakness for us. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.